Hi everyone, um, I'm Jay Haridas, one of the dev managers in the Windows Azure Storage team. I'll be giving a brief introduction about Windows Azure Storage today uh, and the various abstractions that we have and how you can build internet scale applications on top of Windows Azure Storage. So to start with, uh, what is Windows Azure Storage? It's a cloud storage system uh, which provides you anytime, anywhere access to your storage. It's durable and highly available. We make, uh, we store multiple st uh, replicas of your data and we store it in such a form that it can be resilient to certain network uh, failures or even upgrades and that's why it's highly available. It's massively scalable. We have a partitioning system, an auto partitioning system, so no more traditional manual shards or anything of that sort. It just massively scales uh, and, it, and our partitioning system partitions it or load balances it uh, depending on the traffic that comes in. Um, so you can easily build internet scale applications on top of Windows Azure Storage. Um, we have over 300 petabytes of raw storage today and it's growing. Um, it's a utility service. By that we mean that you pay for what you use. Again, unlike traditional systems where you have to go into this capacity planning of data center, how much do we want to, what is our projected growth and things like that, and you start uh, kind of paying for it right up front. Here you pay for what you use. So if you start small, you pay for only whatever you've stored, and th from there on you go ahead and uh, um, based on how your application scales, you start paying for what, whatever you're using, or rather the transactions and the storage you're using. Um, we expose a very easy to use REST API. Uh, it's open, it's, 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 it's an open interface, it's well documented, and uh, you can uh, kind of use the REST APIs to build your internet scale applications. In addition, we understand that many of our customers don't want to go down to the depth of the REST. Uh, interface. So we have built client libraries in .NET, Java, Node.js. We truly believe that cloud is language agnostic and hence we provided various languages uh, to kind of access your data and, uh, and store your data and access it basically. I had mentioned that we have various abstractions. We have various abstractions that we provided uh, uh, on the fundamental storage system. Uh, Blobs is a highly scalable unstructured data store. You can think of it as a simple interface to store files, images, videos, and you can share these files, images, and videos. Tables, it's a NoSQL structured storage system which auto scales. Um, and it's extremely easy to use um, sto a structured storage system. Queues is a scalable, reliable, uh, and a persistent asynchronous messaging system that enables you to kind of build these workflow and uh, workflow applications or process flow applications and basically decouple these components that may need to communicate uh, with each other in a distributed system. So to begin with Windows Azure Blobs, you get a namespace. The namespace is nothing but your account.blob.go.windows.net. There's a single storage account and there is no limit on how many entities you can store other than the storage space itself on a single storage account. So each storage account can store about 100 terabytes of data. Besides that limit, there's no other limit on number of containers or number of blobs or number of tables uh, and so on and so forth. So the only limit that you need to look at from capacity perspective is the 100 terabytes. So once you get a storage account, with the storage account you get two secret keys and you use that secret keys uh, uh, to kind of authenticate your request. So once you get that account, you can start creating these containers for blobs. You can create how many of containers you want. Uh, all the container names are lower cased. And then once you have the containers, you can start storing the blobs in your container. And the way you address your blob is basically the namespace, account.blob.go.windows.net, um, and then the container name and the blob name. So what are the scenarios you can think of using blobs for? Uh, our, our customers, uh, our enterprise customers store documents, for example. All the documents that were traditionally uh, in-house on-premise can, for example, be stored in the cloud for various reasons that it's scalable, available, and you don't need any more data center planning. How much, how many documents am I going to have? Um, and also, how do I provide anytime, anywhere access? 
In addition, um, you can start storing, you can think of storing logs which you need to process. Um, there's enough compute power in Windows Azure, you can store these logs in Windows Azure storage as blobs and then you can use the compute power in Windows Azure to go and process these logs and get various telemetry data. And you can think of social sharing like photos, videos, blogs, backed by CDN um, to be built on top of Windows Azure storage. Uh, you can go and enable CDN to kind of um, make sure that you, you deliver your blob contents, your videos or music uh, to various geographical locations very efficiently to your customers. The other big use case which we've seen are backups, uh, device backups, file backups, computers, where you start storing music so that you, it's, it's a reliable backup in the cloud and you can access it anywhere. You can sync it to your various devices. So this is one more common use case for a cloud storage system like Windows Azure Blobs. In terms of ArcLink, every request um, needs to be authenticated. And hence, by default, every access or every blob entity is private. However, for social sharing or even enterprise sharing, maybe you are you writing your blogs and you want to be want it to be accessed by everyone. You could set your containers to be public, in which case we allow anonymous access to your blobs. You want to share your blob content or your content with only a subset of folks rather than everyone, right? You don't want it to be available anonymously. You want it to be, you want to choose whom you want to share it with. So this is where shared access signature comes in, where it's pre-authenticated URL, and you share the URL with uh, all the folks that you want to give access to, and you, it, you can give granular permissions, like I want to give read access only to these sets of folks. I, I want to give write access to just my family for my photos maybe and things like that so you can give this granular permissions and these permissions can ex and the permission to the URL itself can expire in terms of APIs um, we have obviously create containers put and get blobs copy blob is another um, very useful API where you want to start copying blobs and make backup of your blob yourself to uh, protect your application from application errors, basically. In addition, uh, we have introduced a copy blob across accounts. It's a new feature that we've introduced, and we will talk more about it at TechEd. But um, we've introduced uh, a, a, a cross account copy. Get set metadata, where you can start storing these metadata with the blob. You can think of snapshots as another interesting scenario where you can think of it as a version of your blob. You can snapshot your blob to create versions or checkpoint your blobs to create versions and then you can always go back and um, promote your version to be the uh, writable copy. The snapshots are read-only copies. Windows Azure Table, uh, like I said, it's a NoSQL solution. It's a scalable auto-scale solution uh, for structured storage where once again the namespace is account.table.co.windows.net once you have an account, you can start creating tables. Once you have these tables, you can start storing entities. We call it entities or objects. Uh, these entities are schema-less. It has three mandatory properties today. One, two uh, form the clustered index, which is partition key and row key. Out here, I've just abbreviated it as PK and RK. This forms your clustered index. But it's other than these mandatory properties, the rest of the properties are just schema-less. You can store whatever you need to out there as name value, key value pairs. So what are the scenarios you can think of using Windows Azure tables? Uh, Internet scale almost always requires a NoSQL structured store where you store your data in a denormalized form. You shape your data so that it is very easy to access and you reduce the number of IOs required for whatever operation you want to perform at Internet scale. For example, websites, if I have my own video sharing or if I have my music sharing site, I might want to create user registration. Uh, I, I want this user registration to scale to like you know billions of users. And for that, I need to have an efficient denormalized data structure. And that's where uh, Windows Azure table comes into picture. Uh, you can think of it as comment tracking, address book, uh, various scenarios that you can build efficiently on top of uh, Windows Azure table and it's very easy to use. Um, key value stores, 
many applications need uh, a store that where you can store some key and associated with that is a value that you want to have fast access to. Ackles, again, everything is private by default. And yes, we have introduced shared access signatures with a new version where you can now provide shared access signatures to users to access your table. And you can say, I want to give a read permission for all my entities where the partition key is, let's say, uh, developers. So all developers can, I, I want my developers to get access to all the developer content in my table. Uh, all these mobile apps that you develop, um, you don't want to give your secret key out and store it on the mobile device. So you would give out these shared access signatures or signed URLs to the device and the device can now access the content uh, without compromising your secret keys. With respect to the APIs, we have create table, insert operations, update operations, and then there are various scenarios where you want to uh, figure if the entity exists in the table. If the entity exists, you want to update it. If it does not, you want to insert it. So rather than having these two lookups, you want to do an efficient one round trip. And we've introduced this operation called upsert. Um, so you can upsert entities where, you, where it would update if the entity already exists or it'll insert the entity content. With respect to queries, the most efficient is index lookup. You have a one clustered index that has been provided in the table, which is partition key and row key. You can use that for single entity lookups. It's very efficient. Uh, in addition to that, you can do small scans. And there are, there's a rich filter that we provided uh, where you can start filtering on various properties. But small scans uh, to limit the scan um, based on your clustered index uh, that can be performed efficiently. In addition, you might want your background worker roles, which are not latency sensitive, um, to kind of do these larger scans, your table scans per se, to kind of uh, go and process the data. Windows Azure Queue, we said that Queue is a messaging system. It allows this asynchronous messaging pattern between components to decouple these components and uh, allow it to scale, which is usually needed in a distributed system. And once you have a storage account, you can start creating the queues. Uh, once you have the queue, you start adding messages, and the message processors can start dequeuing these messages and processing them. With respect to scenarios, I think I've already said this. Uh, it's very useful between uh, between uh, role uh, when you have inter-role communication as such. For example, if that's my kind of a scenario, what I would have is in my website, uh, in my web role, I would um, when the user uploads a blob. I would add a message into the queue and then upload the blob. And then the message worker, whenever it, it dequeues that message, would go and process the blob. It will do whatever image processing it requires or scans it for viruses and things of that. Um, so various scenarios of that uh, nature where you want communication between your web role and a worker role can be done using Windows Azure queues very efficiently. In addition, you might have a process flow or a workflow, for example, an order processing uh, workflow. You can do this by adding a message and updating the message to say, OK, I've finished the order processing. I've finished the shipment. I've finished the uh, delivery of the uh, shipment and things like that. So you can have these various states saved in the message and have the workflow implemented uh, using Windows Azure queues. With respect to ACLs, again, everything is private by default. And yes, we've introduced shared access signatures for queues uh, so that now you don't need your secret keys to go and give this permission to some processor to process these messages or uh, maybe your mobile device to start adding messages to the queue. Um, so now you can just have the shared access signatures given, uh, which, are time delimit which, which can be time delimited and uh, granular permissions. With respect to APIs, we have create queue, NQ, DQ, and delete. Uh, one thing to note out here, which is a very good differentiating factor, is we have the two-phase processing stage, which is you dequeue the message while processing. And the message is not de deleted uh, from the queue, but instead it is made invisible in the queue uh, to other uh, processors, which might be dequeuing. And then once the processor finishes uh, processing the message, it can go and delete this message, and that's when it's removed from the queue. 
The reason is because a message processor can dequeue the message but then crash before it has processed it. You don't want to kind of lose this processing and hence we have provided this visibility timeout where we make it invisible for certain time and once that time expires it will be, be it will be made visible again for the next processor. We allow you to store metadata with the queue itself. In addition there are certain system metadata that we provide you. Uh, we provide message count which can be used for auto scaling. You can up or uh, you can scale up or scale down the number of instances for your message processors. And we also provide something called the DQ count on our single message which can be used to handle poison messages. Uh, you can use this DQ count to figure out how many times a message was DQ'd. Update messages, you can update messages uh, to kind of set the state or state of the processing so you can stay, uh, save the intermittent states in your message processing uh, very efficiently now. I wanted to talk about Windows uh, Azure Storage Analytics because developing distributed systems, one of the things that's differentiating from a single client application is how do you diagnose when there is a problem. It's a distributed system, especially with uh, Windows Azure uh, Cloud Storage. How do you get this visibility as what happened uh, to my storage data, right? Um, and so we provided logging and um, metrics every hour per service. So every request that comes in is logged into this into your namespace, and uh, is also aggregated. We aggregate various information like latency, um, what is the size of the incoming message, what is the egress, ingress, and all these things, including IP addresses. And we save all this information into your logs and also we aggregate this information in your metrics. This can be used to learn and optimize your application. Optimize not only for performance but also for cost efficiency. And I'll show a quick demo of how you can optimize it. It also enables this end-to-end -end debugging which is just very, very valuable in my opinion because your, web, your, your web role, for example, which is uploading um, messages or uploading entities into table or blobs into blob storage can add this client request ID into it and this is logged into your request. Uh, so you can use this for end-to-end -end debugging to see, hey, what happened? Uh, with storage analytics, what you could do is take control of diagnostics in your application and you get uh, basically more knowledge about how you're using storage and how you can save costs for your application. In addition, all this is done for you without impacting your storage account itself or rather your live data or your application data because the analytics is stored in a separate namespace within the same storage account. You can also use this to track and analyze interesting telemetry data like find geographical distribution of user base because the client IP is logged. You can also figure out which resources are used uh, the most. So all these things can be done and I wanted to give a quick demo now on uh, storage analytics. So I'm using uh, the Cerebrata Cloud Studio to just view my analytics. I have this web role which allows you to upload uh, users to migrate their blobs to the cloud. And uh, what I want to see is I ran this today at around 15 hours, which is 8 o'clock uh, Pacific time. And I w what I want to see is how did it fare? Um, so this is what I get. So I, ha I made 2000, two, 2009 requests in that hour to my blobs and um, to my blob service. And what I see is the latency is great. Uh, it's 14 milliseconds uh, server latency, 15 milliseconds end-to-end -end latency. That's not bad. But my person success is just 50 percent. So 50 percent of my requests actually succeeded. So what happened to the rest of the 50 percent of my uh, requests that failed? So I can go down and I see that create container has always failed. I had about 1,000 requests made and every one of them failed. And let's see what happened out there. And it says that all the 100 or rather all the 1,000 requests failed because of client other error. What does client error, error mean? It means that there's a bug in, it's an expected error from the storage perspective, from the service per perspective. From Windows Azure Storage Service, it means it's an expected error. And so now I'll get into my logs for that particular hour. And I want to look at create containers. I'll just filter it out for just create container. 
And if you look at it, every request failed with a 409 status code, which means this container al always existed. It seems like I'm trying to create this container every time some user comes in and tries to upload the blob. So let's look at my source code for upload blobs. Once I kind of comment this out, I don't have to create it every time. I can just create on start of my, of, of my web role, maybe, to create this single container to which all the users will start uploading their blobs to. Uh, once I did that, in the next hour, let's look how my metrics looked. My person success now was almost 100 person because my user create container, I just had one failure. So everything kind of, uh, it, it's more efficient. I had like 1,000 requests before. I reduce it to one. I've, I'm paying less cost now for my transactions, which were like not needed because the container always always existed. So you can use this for various scenarios like that. Um, for example, to figure out the difference between your end-to-end -end latency and server latency to figure out if there's a network problem on your end or uh, anywhere in between, things like that. So there's various use cases for analytics. I would highly um, encourage you to enable that and start using it. Thank you